Can you believe we have done 20 episodes of Feed the Trolls? 21, actually. But I started this thing where after the first 10, I did like a recap. So I thought I would do a recap after the the first 20 as well, just for fun. Uh, what this is, is just a video of some of my favorite moments from the last 10 episodes. So episode 11 all the way through to episode 20. Uh, that's not true. I'm, let me not lie. The truth is every episode I cut like a long piece of content. It's like two, three minutes for social media. And I have this piece of content just sitting there. So I was like, after the first 10, I was like, screw it. Like I've used it once. I'm going to mash them all together and put them up in a video. And now I'm doing the same for, for our 20, the best of 20, if you like. Uh, but it is cool to put this together. Go back, think about what we spoke about, see where we got it so wrong, see where we got it so right. Uh, it's really cool. For those of you that have been supporting the podcast, thank you. I appreciate your support immensely. I, I can't believe how people are just so supportive of Feed the Trolls. It's freaking rad. Uh, I've told this story before, but I, I thought I'd share it with you. Obviously, this whole thing stemmed from a situation where I didn't really have any broadcast work and Thorin suggested I, I you know, put my free time to good use and he offered to, to help find the guests and be on the show. So a lot of the cool banger guests you see, because you always say like, wow, this person is so rad. It's normally Thorin that, that finds the guest. I come up with the topic, tell them what I want to speak about, uh, what I feel is sort of relevant at the time what i what i think everyone's talking about and then we we find the the necessary guest to, to fit that and he does such a great job of that and that's what the premise of the show is and that's what it's going to continue to be the idea is that we're feeding the trolls it comes from the joke of don't feed the trolls on the internet uh trolls always talking about something right so you're the trolls by the way if you didn't get that yet uh, and i try and see what's kind of Topical and Counter-Strike, and that's what we talk about uh, and try to get it up as much as possible. That's a quick introduction to what Feed the Trolls is. If you've been here for the last 10 episodes, then this is just going to take you down a walk, uh, take you down a walk of memory lane. I'm a bit sick, so I can't even speak English. Uh, it's going to take you down memory lane. Uh, if you haven't been here, I'm hoping you, you watch these little snippets and get excited and go back and watch some of the episodes. You can find them all on my channel. And that is it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. I hope you'll be here for the next 10 and I'll see you soon with a new episode. But first, go watch this. Why do you think more teams aren't really that interested in, in putting the resources into an academy team? I don't think teams know how, honestly. I think a lot of the problem was just not having the understanding and the knowledge of like, how do we make this something worthwhile? Um, not just in terms of having like a reasonably competitive academy roster who, you know, when it was around can do well in we play and then, you know, maybe make some deep runs in these like CCT type events online, um, but actually creating a team of players who might have the potential to step up into tier one and might have the potential to step up into your main team like full time. I think that was the problem. And this is actually something HLTV are like looking into. We might do like a, something a bit more in depth on how Mao's won the Academy game like further down the line, because I think it's a super interesting topic and it was sure. fascinating to hear from Mao's internally like what they did how they approached it because like i say i think it was a relatively unique approach um it was coherent it wasn't slapdash and it it told in the results like they won like pretty much every we play academy league season they took part in their players are now up there at the top like you know four academy players are up there arguably on the best team in the world um and i think yeah i think it, it just comes down to so many other teams didn't know how to do it the right way and also, like I say, I think teams saw maybe not an academy team as a novelty, but they saw it in like a different way of like, ah, this is never going to have any impact on our main team. Like, there's no way to do that. So we'll just have a team for the sake of branding, like another name out there. Or like I say, we'll use it as um, a national team. So we can have like, like Apex have their Norwegian academy team when their main team was international. So um, I think that was it. I think a lot of organizations didn't see it as that was what it could do it could actually get you players that are going to be really good and useful for your main team um and then i think yeah other organizations just saw it as they just saw it as something different that's not what it was supposed to be i think in their i eyes. actually think some orgs literally did it for two very cynical reasons they didn't actually have like good faith intentions of as you're saying like developing a player and if he is good enough really put him in the main squad i think there's two obvious cynical reasons a lot of orgs did it one is as part of the overall pr package is why i think an astralis did it they do it because when they then go to investors and they talk about the org this makes it sound like your sports it's like we've got our academy team of course and you know one of them's even been standing in for our rmr like that sounds to a you know the guy who already knows sports ball he's going to know exactly 
wow, this is a very professional organization. It doesn't matter that you're never really going to have that guy play next to the Vikes in three years or whatever, you know. Then the other angle, obviously, is even if they don't think that they're going to use the players, I think actually some people just think, look, he might not be good enough to play my team, but once he's famous, now he has a big buyout for the other team. So they also then think the difference is maybe I can fleece Gamer Legion of 100k for this guy, you know what I mean? Instead of like, you're actually playing for me. Okay, so hear me out because the G2 fans on, before they slit on. their wrists. What angle is she got here? Come on. <laughs> Surely you've got the experience of Snacks. He can yeah. move into different roles, right? So you put him in a position where he changes up. Hopefully, I mean, Hansa hasn't really been performing. He is also potentially experienced enough. You move him out and you give Mulbs the, the positions that he needs to shine. I would love that. Does yeah. that. I mean, does that happen or do we all just shit on the new kid? It should so, happen, right, Phil? If we had, if like someone saying was in control who didn't just look like, uh, you're not Serbian, you know, if someone didn't do that, so actually analyze it, I think it's a, a very reasonable suggestion. She's not being silly about suggesting that, right? Yeah, I mean, the problem is, are you ready to give up on Hunter? And it seems like they're not. Because, uh, yes. I mean, if you look at it, like, in my opinion, G2 just hasn't had the firepower to win events yes. this year, right? Because Hunter's not been there. And if they're not going to replace Hunter... I, I don't think they're ready to give up on Hunter. He was too good for too long. So, yeah, I think in theory, if we're talking about, like, how can they be good until the end of the year, I think you would want to give Mobs his chance. But if I'm their GM, if I'm their coach, am I even ready to give up on Hunter yet? I don't know what, at what point you just say Hunter's is not going to be good in CS2. I think that's the question you have to answer before you even answer what Mobs should be doing. Here's the black pill. <laughs> or maybe it should be, I don't know, the Balkan pill or something. I'll come up with a, a quick term for it on another show, right? Basically, the problem is, Vu, it's inferred to me, if I add together all the rumours I've heard over the last year or two, that, like, the joke is Hunter is the only unkickable person who will probably always be in G2 for years to come, Vu, because if you have a look at the team, first of all, you notice his name is never in, involved with those roster moves. Oh, maybe he'll be in Vitality or Liquid. He's never on the roster moves. So, first of all, it's not like there's mass, you know, demand elsewhere. Then, secondly, Pekka, the GM of this team, is literally literally his guy from that crazy team years ago when they used to play with Nexa, who the Pekka guy also recruits. Already, you start to see there's a few connections being made on my bo mad board with all the conspiracy stuff. And then also, those rumours aren't a joke. Like, through the whole... Well, let's just say the whole of this year, there have been rumours constantly that Monacy or Nico, and by the way, not as a package deal, go elsewhere. So if you add it all together and then you look at who they have kicked out, it's sort of implied to me that that's why I actually think you might be onto something with the idea it's a stopgap just till the next major or through the next season. Because I think also what G2 is waiting for is do Nico and Monacy just go elsewhere? Like maybe they really do sign elsewhere, in which case, what have you got? And I'll tell you what, in that scenario, even though I actually think Hunter's in bad form, I think they view that as like, that's the only piece we'll have to build around again. So bizarrely, he does never seem to be on the chocolate block. I've noticed that. It's, and I can't think it's just really the whole he's Nico's cousin thing because Nico might not even be there in the future. But bizarrely, it seems like he's the one person no one can conceptually be allowed to consider cutting because I actually think it's a very fair thing. In the same way, by the way, earlier this year, people were saying maybe Nico's not as good. I think that uh, was a legitimate statement. He maybe wasn't as much of a star in playoff games. So if we're going to do that to Nico, well, the all time like a Mount Rushmore player, I think it's pretty reasonable to say Hunter hasn't been it since CS go. Wouldn't you argue though that what they've cut, what, what I think Groove is trying to do here is he's got a really nice mix of a bit more experienced players who granted maybe aren't playing at their best, but haven't exactly, I mean, considering Cloud9 was running around CS2 without an AWP, they held their own at a lot of those S tier tournaments. And now you've added in some younger, fresher talent that can ultimately lean on them and learn. I think it's a really nice foundation, I would say, to build on. And then like Duncan mentioned, you bring in those pieces, you do a little bit more of the smarter build versus this is what I think a lot of teams have tried to do with this whole like super team thing that has just failed time and time and time again. Like now it's like, okay, we'll build a strong foundation. We have all these pieces and then we slowly move a piece out and bring a better one in and you can build a team into something really strong that, that goes the distance. Is that maybe the play here? If you're a Cloud9 fan, Vendetta, you said, oh, there's nothing to be excited about. Could that be what you're getting excited about? That there's like a long-term play happening here? I mean, yeah, no, if, if you're a Cloud9 fan, you kind of have to like hold on to that like insanely thin rope and kind of think to yourself like <laughs> in six months time heavy god and ic are gonna have a remarkable uh kind of progression in in what they're doing again like heavy god has done really well in endpoint and whatnot but again he hasn't played a top 10 team that's true like yeah. i think he played like one in the last six months or year or something and obviously again he's playing for endpoint so it's going to be like a tough matchup regardless but didn't do fair too well there and, and again same thing with ic you're just gonna have to hope that they go bananas or maybe that interest was the key that unlocked axile all along and we just didn't know right like that's really all i'm seeing because i don't think we're going to see any sort of like 
um, like revamp of Boomich as a player where he suddenly becomes like this amazing entry fragger because he was never that. He was like basically like the decoy for Electronic and Navi. And obviously when they grouped up again in Cloud9, I've said are like more of the same. And again, that works if you have Electronic, but you don't have Electronic anymore. You don't have a player of that caliber to basically make it worthwhile sacrificing your life more often than not. So yeah, no, you putting all your cards that Heavy God and, and IC are going to be really, really good in a really short amount of time. And I don't really see where you go from there in terms of like what kind of one player swap you do six months from now or a year from now that's going to elevate this roster like in, in, like in a big way. Doesn't that seem so cruel to this player though? Because he's new to... The, I mean, he's there's a whole step he's missing. I... I, I I compare him a lot to, okay. to Icy with Cloud9, where like you kind of saw the progression, you saw him do some good stuff, kind of his name was in, okay. in the mix. So now he's taken that step up into tier one and you go, okay, cool, like this is your chance. I feel like Ultimate's missed this entire chunk. Now he's stepped up. And if this fails, I think that's the end of his career. He doesn't get sure. back into tier one after that. It feels a little bit unfair to use this guy mm -hmm. as the potential scapegoat in a case like that. When you had someone like OC, who granted I don't think is the greatest, but at least he comes with a little bit of experience. Yeah, that's why true. didn't they go why didn't they go for something like that? What was the I, I still can't get over the thinking here. All right, I'll give you the spicy segment that will get the headlines. So here's how it goes. Yay. When you say, isn't it unfair? I'd say like, yes and no. It's unfair in the sense that you are right. The actual most likely outcome is this guy plays. I agree with Flom. I actually think the hardest job in all of Counter-Strike is to go from like tier 1.5 AWPA to tier 1 AWPA because the point is, it's a, it's a kill or miss gun and you're now playing against Mono CZ. You know, like you're just going to get farmed. But you're gonna, people will know the classic examples, OC, Farley, Mantu, all these people were good at their level. And then when you put them against the absolute best, they just didn't look as good. And it, by the way, there's a reason they all aren't in top teams anymore. So I do think the problem is it's a massive jump up. And almost certainly when this lineup fails, when people go down the limbs, right? No one is going to hit on Twist, even if he's not as good as IGL, because they know he could still be a good player, right? No one's going to hit on JKS. He's been out in the city. It's obviously going to be this guy. And he's also the opposite. So every time you miss, it looks really bad. <laughs> as a rifler, you can miss and do the two bullets and another guy and still contribute. You know what I mean? So I do feel like in a way it's unfair, but here's why it's not at all unfair. Because I actually, you, you just said it there. He didn't actually earn this spot. I'm just going to say that right now. He didn't do anything in tier 1 million. That means anyone was even like, he must be in a top team. Bro, forget even Team Liquid. No one even wanted this motherfucker on OG. Like, nobody cares that this guy lived or died as far as I can tell. So in a way, I would spin it the other way and go, it's a bit unfair in the sense, why does this fucker get to get a Team Liquid salary? Why does he potentially get to go to the major? Why does he get to sit next to prime twists and naff and go, hey, I... I am an equal teammate. Oh, and what's that? I have the most expensive gun. Please actually hand me the gun. Talking about a team that we used to see in finals all the time, a team that we saw lift lots of trophies, and a team that is not in those finals in the last few, I'd say the last few months after the major, they just seem to have completely lost their form. They're a fan favorite. They're one of my favorite teams, FaZe. What do you think's happening there, Thorin? This is, by the way, FaZe is a very good example of why what we just talked about with Vitality, it's not always the case that you can just sort of stick and choose not to hit or fold in this sense because they would have said the same thing, right? If I'd have said to you, hey, they've only won one tournament, it wasn't the major, it wasn't kind of eight and they've had all these seconds, everyone else would tell me, Bro, they're in the final every time. How can you touch that team? Same concept, by the way. Everyone except Vitality, they can, and by the way, after the major, they can even beat Vitality. They can beat everyone. They're right there. They're just, but I'll tell you what, you have a look. They only got that one trophy in this period this year. And now they didn't touch anything and it's just gone down. The level's just gone down one step and you see, now they're actually in, in a rot, but it's a rot where you just make the playoffs and lose immediately. And even worse, some of these matches, they're not even always like great matches anymore, which is, that's the biggest worrying thing to me. It's not that you lost. Like I actually think some of the finals run is a little bit lucky. Like if you ever go look, spoiler, since they couldn't beat Vitality at one point, they had to draw them in the final. Otherwise they'd have lost in the semi-final or the quarterfinals as people like Mouse did back then if you go. But the problem I have is, I just think if you look at this lineup, 
Like the best thing about FaZe, even in CSGO, was if they lost, they could lose in the, in the quarters of the semis, but it would be the hardest match for the other team to win. The other team had to put like 10 out of 10 level CS. Usually you had to yourself like prevail in a big like pressure moment on stage or win like a second map that's a 14-14 overtime session. Like nowadays, they actually sometimes lose and just get clapped. Like that's the more worrying thing to me. And then also, I thought last year's CSGO phase was massively about just basically setting Rops up to play the game. It was just about providing a scenario where he could do all those crazy lurks. He could, he could be, by the way, he could be as indulgent as he wanted. Sometimes he would absolutely lurk and just bait. But it's because if he ever got into those scenarios, he could win the most magical 1v3s and 1v4s you've ever seen. That Rops doesn't exist in CS2 as far as I can tell. I've never seen that guy so far, maybe at the very beginning of CS2 last year. So I think actually the part of the problem is you have stock, and I don't think it's that Carrigan's changed some or gotten worse or the coaching's worse. It just seems like, unfortunately, some the player performance has gone down and then also I think if you look at CS2's gone on hasn't the competition got more and more and more competitive like now we're looking at a world where there's like five teams can win tournaments when they were making the finals there was three it was more like two or three so I think actually right now funnily enough FaZe even though no one ever discusses them doing a roster move they might be in a more advanced version of where Vitality yeah I think actually if you're FaZe this probably is what you start to think is there someone we could make a change with or is there someone that would be the fix tomorrow there is a level of unhinged fan that may take what you say as gospel and like really go all out to, yes, hate on the internet, but there is also concern from my side sure. of like physical harm as well at an event. Sure. Yeah, but um, that, that, like, go on. Yeah. You, can, you can go if you no, want. No, sorry, just because she said also, uh, because Sam said, said physical harm, uh, there's also something that um, like I'm a bit worried about because like a lot of players, they're like, you know, from like not older generation, but like, let's say like everyone 25 plus maybe, you know, like, it's a bit different, you know, like I would say like they're a bit different than maybe the new players coming in who are like now 17, 18, who maybe grew up a bit more like only with social media, who are more like isolated. Um, I honestly also worry that if this thing, if this string trend uh, keeps going on and uh, people just look, who who are we blaming next? Who is the next scapegoat? Oh, also no, we're going. People by are talent. probably going to kill themselves, right? Yes. And, yeah, it's and probably going to happen. Something. I yeah, think so. and I, I feel also yeah. like eventually someone who maybe struggles yeah. in real life as well with something or, or he's like fighting anxiety depression uh like I, I i honestly i have like really the worry that this will happen one sure. day and then and then what do we do you know like i yes. feel like um like this is something that worries me because like i think like players who are like a bit older you know they they deal they handle this thing different differently they're like used to it to hate and whatever it's fine like it's not fine anyway but i don't think any one of them is gonna like you know sure. suicide but honestly if you look like at like uh, younger generations they're like a bit different now than the, yeah. the players who are like 25 till 30 you know like they're completely differently viral wired i also feel like in general like mental health is like becoming a bigger issue also with like people growing up with social media and everything and this is something that people like really don't uh, think through you know on the long-term thing do you think that that's the the rise of vitality now? Is it? Have we seen enough, Thorin? Do you think? That I think they're the truth, personally. I think they're really good. Like, it's one of the reasons why I hyper focus on Zewu because here's the difference. If you ever actually go back to 2019 when he first came in the scene, I always used to say the one area fans were wrong is they used to look at the rating and see he had four players that had have like the 1.0 rating, and they'd go, "He's got no help." And I would go, "Mate, he doesn't have fragging firepower help, but he has the best players France ever produced." If I'm a rookie. Of course, I want like NBK and RPK and Apex in my team. Like, you've just filled out all the roles for fuck's sake. So, if they're doing a one point, oh, they did their job and then they let my superstar on the platform go crazy and kill everyone. Hence, why Alex did the infamous stupid interview where he said we just flash for him and that's why he gets all the kills, which yeah. is obviously an absurd statement at this point in time. But the difference is, then you went to that lineup with Masuta and Kyojin. That was a fucking travesty. It wouldn't yeah. have mattered if he was simple. You wouldn't have won the events with that lineup. So I have felt for Zeebo many years when I felt like he did sometimes either have to be all the firepower or for those ones, they were actually literally, because Kyojin was like starting 4v5 every time. That's impossible. But with this lineup this year, one of my takes on every show has been actually Zeebo. You could have won every single tournament you were in a semi or final game. If you were just the best player in the server, like everyone tells me you are, you win all these events. Because when I look at your squad, bro, do you know how many other teams Teams would be desperate to take your players if you kick them. You kick Spinks tomorrow, boom, he's in Falcons or something like that. He's probably going to be like one of the top 20 players in the year. They'd be start getting better. If you kick Flames, probably FaZe kind of something takes him tomorrow instead of Rain. They're back on top again. By the way, little Mezzi that no one gave a fuck about. The guy who, by the way, got all those entries on Mirage, just rounded out the team. He ended, I think, plus minus zero for the whole four maps. 
He plays the worst fucking roles. That means he did his job. Like this team's actually, I think the roster is very good. They might not be as cohesive as you'd want. You saw in this Navi game, they could just fuck up two VXs at the end of the game. But I'll tell you what, the firepower they have now is nuts. Like it isn't just Zewu. Sometimes you're just running onto a site and Spinks and Flames have killed everyone and you just got the site for free. Sometimes without any utility. So I think if you look at this roster, I think this roster can win the Shanghai Major. They'd be one of my top two teams. I think it's the, I, would, I don't know if I kill, still go with Spirit now, I'll probably have to put Navi there for the moment in light of what they've done and give them that respect. But this would still be one of the absolute favourites to win the Major for me. And Zewu is still really good. Maybe he took a while to warm up in that final. But the point is when he warms up no one can stop him that's why once he got going on mirage you had to know if they won that map it was over you had to know that, that at that point you've let the beast awaken now mate you had your chance you had your two and a half maps you didn't get them though so i think vitality is a very good roster and I, I, again it's classic saying in punditry but embarrassment of riches the players they've got you know how many teams who kill for this lineup i mean for for me i i think uh where it's actually freakishly unlucky we're not in a vitality era right yeah they now. should be we're the not, one that won everything talking about that i mean like it, at the major it kind of felt like once we got to the semi-finals like anything could could have happened yeah i genuinely believed we were on rails for g2 navi well well really g2 uh, that that veto messed them up messed them up but it was a master class uh from carrigan in the vitality game yep. before then bottling it in the final in a stadium he's bottled it in before by the That's way fine. if not if vitality made that final they win that major richard come on yeah yeah no i i i i concur and i i'll i'll say as well the 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 real freakish one is there is the three nil uh final oh, the, loss in yeah, the, the league against yeah. mouse right Yep. Where they they bet they didn't get double digit rounds on a single no, it's crazy. map. I don't know what happened there. I mean, you know, you have to point the finger at your IGL, but the pressure Messi was under coming out of that. Oh, for then, sure. Then they go to Dallas. Okay, well, you definitely win that one. But no, the the G stew factor. Yeah, miracle. In. You know, they've got they've got. I mean, literally a miracle run and yeah. also a miracle crowd, which no one talks True. about. Yeah, it's yeah. NA fans. True. They were on some Astralis bullshit there. But I mean, like you know, that was there was. There was two overtimes in that best of three. Yep. And so Vitality could have conceivably won that. Then you have the spring finals and they got Shiro. Shiro had yep. like one of the performances of the year to knock them out in the semi finals again. These are all the best performances of all these teams, if you notice yep. this year. Everyone's having so, the game of their life. It, next to Cologne, they probably conceivably could have had a major, should have had a pro league, in my opinion. Should have had a Dallas, in my opinion. So they would be the yes, inarguably agreed. number one team right now. Um, what I did notice, what I will say, the difference maker for me in Cologne was Apex, actually. Uh, like, sure, Zewu didn't go missing in, in big games. But, I mean, like, the, put it this way. The Inferno map was fucking ridiculous. There was a round where they won one round with a clutch, wonderful, I think, like, me messed it up, and they got, like, a two, uh, like 1v2 uh, to win. Then Spinks burst out of apartments, got a 3k with a ridiculous double spray transfer, one of the maddest things I've ever seen. And then in the next round, Apex ran at Banana like he used to do back in the day and just killed three people in two seconds. And and, and it was like, oh, okay, well, that's that. They're, they're definitely winning this map. And uh, credit to Narvi for pulling it back and making it 39. But Apex called a masterclass in the final, but his yep. individual level of performance was insane. And his entry fragging was actually insane uh, on Inferno. He, he had such a monstrous performance. So, you know, with Mezzi raising his level and Apex having, I mean, he said it himself, I think in the previous round, he said he had a life game. Well, no, the life game actually did come in the final. If they if they can maintain even a fraction of that, like Vitality are definitely in with a shout of the next major. They'll be there or thereabouts. Is this a is this a lineup that is in contention for playoff runs, Thorin? Because they are going to be together till the major. So if you're a complexity the fan, this is, is what you're stuck with. At the moment, they're like always right on the borderline. They're the team that'll like make it in the last time or upset someone else like a VP or someone and ruin their playoff run, then they'll make it through. The other issue you have though is even if they make a playoff, they're pretty much you, almost everyone you can imagine in a, a stadium beats them in the opening round. 
Like, if they'd have made the global yeah. playoffs, everyone beats them. You know what I mean? They lose to Mouth, Vitality, Nava, everyone. So there's that. To me, it's obvious you do need to make a roster move. You've had this five-man lineup for long enough. Now, what's sad is, probably the most infuriating thing to me is, because you've got a liege, and I actually think JT's and IGL's one of the better IGL's, I don't think you even need it to be like, it doesn't have to be an eco or some fucking superstar player. Seriously, it doesn't even actually have to be a star necessarily. Like, if you can keep a liege and Holzerk's all right, let's say you could have added, I mean, obviously I'm spitball and whether these ideas... Imagine you could have added Perfecto. Mate, that could be the win right there. Think how many games you might win just off that guy winning a 1v2 or holding a fucking CT spot. That's, that's why actually... Yeah. yeah, that's why even though I understand for historical reasons why they didn't want to do it, I was another person pushing for why weren't they considering JKS? Look, maybe JKS doesn't want to join their team. I don't know. But to me, it's another one where it's like, bro, it just rounds our team out, gives us a little bit extra firepower to better player in a position. It's actually a world-class player. I think that's all you need is one more player. It can be an AWP, it can be an aggressive rifle, it could be a supportive element. Just give me one more true good player, and, and I think this team could do something. And, and earlier you said they should just dis, bend, but in reality, that's because we're just mad at them, right? Yeah, but of in reality, we're just mad at them. But the truth is, like, it really does seem like if you do one more move for a leash, you upgrade, like you're saying, the late round a little bit. If you want to divide it up in the early, mid, and late yeah, yeah. round, they got enough early round. They just need a little bit more clutch. This is the this team has no X fact, no Riz in the late round. Okay, no fucking style, no belief. Like in, you need one player who doesn't need other people to believe in him. They need a JKS to pull out the one v two, Perfecto to get the clutch. That you just let him alone. He brings back the energy just by winning. Like let let someone like that. They don't have that at all. He's become a verb. Does that trajectory keep going though? How long does he just keep being dunk? I think he, he's at the start of his career, right? Like, he's still learning. He's still, he's not even a man yet. He's still a child. Um, so, yeah, like, his understanding of the game, you're trying to find that perfect middle ground of utilizing his generational talent and also getting him to the point where he's understanding top-level CS like a grandmaster chess player. Like, he's sort of like moves ahead. He understands um, what his teammates are going to do, their tendencies, how to operate in different environments, whether it's a studio land or it's a big stage and when it, understanding when to reel it in. I think that's modest. He's gone through the same journey right now. You see sometimes that he will overstep the mark and as many rounds as he wins for G2, he gets a little bit too excited and too stuck in sometimes. And that can be a problem. It might not be the most exciting CS to watch, but he needs to evolve into a more well-rounded player that understands every situation he's going into. And that's, that takes time. And he is still learning. And as good as he is, he can get himself out of a lot of sticky situations just like Simple could. He wouldn't necessarily be the most the best decision or the most beautiful tactic or understanding of the situation, but his mechanical skill will bail him out more often than not. So you see that with Monacy, Simple, Donk, these generational talents. You can't replicate, you can't teach people how to play CS like these people because they're just freaks of nature. And you might not play the best CS, but that's also what makes them such an X factor on the server because you're expecting your opponent to take the best fight, the most predictable move. They don't do that. Um, so to answer your question, I feel like, yes, he's got a lot of room to grow. And that's an exciting prospect. And he's definitely going to be the cornerstone of this team spirit organization. You've signed arguably the greatest Counter-Strike talent of all time in his rookie year. Yeah. Um, which is unheard of, unprecedented. And I remember when he first came on the scene like a year ago, we were doing a pro league like two seasons ago and I was doing the interviews at a lobby thing and I was asking everyone like about their settings and stuff. And everyone, even then, when he was just appearing on the scene, even Device was saying like, oh no, I'm using the donk resolution now. I'm using the donk sensitivity. <laughs> That's ridiculous. They the were guy so... won a million majors. Oh, I'm on yeah, the donk, no... donk shit, yeah. Yeah, it was so crazy. <laughs> everyone said they were trying out whatever res Donk wow, was using. Okay. That's what they were going with. This is like a year ago when he just got on the scene. Um, so yeah, like it's unbelievable. Like I don't think we've ever seen anything like this before. Of course, Simple evolved into the greatest yeah, player yeah. of CSGO. He definitely wasn't that at the start. He had a, a lot of issues like from a personality point of view and being over-aggressive on the server. Couldn't find a team that he really gels with. Um, but yeah, Donk has hit the ground running. And if this is his first professional year, like we've never seen anything like it. So it's difficult to like predict how this is going to go forward because we've never seen anyone this good so early on in their career. But logic suggests that he's going to get better and better and a more well-rounded CS player and can contribute more to the team. He'll feel more relaxed doing like the PR stuff and becoming more of a personality like Zywoo had to as well. You remember how shy Zywoo used to be and not want to appear on camera. That's all part of it. Just feeling more confident, feeling more yourself and becoming a man as well. Like when he's actually an adult, that's going to be um, things that will obviously Im impact him and, and as a player. And I think it will just be for the best. He's, he's learning every single tournament he goes to.
So here's a little thing I'll just drop here. I've referenced it on some other shows, but I'll just say it. One of my little birds told me that there actually was a world where let's imagine Elise from Call might have wanted to be on Na'Vi and maybe he could have had him as spot. But then Na'Vi might be the ones that might not have wanted that deal to happen because I would imagine because they've had all these results and they've got the blast run, et cetera, and then winning the play break. So if you think about it, right, that is the sort of move that after the major, a lot of us were salivating for. It's like, right, take that one spot. The reason it was a bomber that Ima was so bad is he had the most, like, literally the most attractive spot for any star rifler in the world. I mean, remember on Mirage, he plays the bloody connector spot on CT side. That's where you just farm stats. Like, every great, like, right, aggressive rifler, so Elise, Antar, you make the list. They'd all want to be in that spot. And then if you think about it, because you're in Na'Vi, you just won the major, but at the time, it looked like you're not going to win anything else. That's also where everyone wants to be in that team, because if you walk in, you get to be the symbol of that team and possibly win everything. So that move would actually, like I said back then, have been the dream. Do you say, I, I would rip their arm off if I hear that move's possible. I can get a lesion. But I have to say, I wouldn't make that move today. As of today, again, I can't know what the chemistry with Elise would be. I can't know how he'd fit in Blade's system, how he'd think of Alexi's calling, how he'd work with one of them. But I'll tell you what, I know how Emma works. And so even though I'm still slightly sceptical about the Emma one specifically, because it's been like a month, I'll still, I'll roll the dice. Again, again, like I say, you have a chance to win every tournament. So right now, I wouldn't make any changes. I'm running out this whole season. If after this season we fail, then we make the big move. It's all good. We'll have had loads of time with this lineup. But as of right now, I mean, this team's probably like, what? Second or third most likely to win the major? You don't ever make a move if you're in that spot, I don't think. I think it'd be a, it'd be a silly gamble to make.